Buona tarda. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining in this uh, new webinar we are organizing from CDOP, the Barcelona Center for International Affairs, this time together with the US uh, Consulate in, in Barcelona, which I would like to thank very much for, for, for the cooperation and for suggesting um, this uh, joint initiative. We will be discussing today on um, disinformation, more precisely manufacturing consensus, Rethinking Disinformation and Propaganda in the Digital Age. Uh, we will be joined by uh, Samuel Woolley, who's a researcher at the Project for Democracy and the Internet at the Stanford University, also Project Director for Propaganda Research at the Center for Media Engagement at the University of Texas. And we will, of course, be joined as well by Karma Kulomina, who will be directing our, our session. And she is the lead researcher at, at CDOP, uh, focusing precisely on, on, on this information in the, in the program that we have at CDOP, um, discussing these issues. So for me, it's a, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all. Thank you very much, Samuel, for, uh, for accepting our, our invitation. And I will give immediately the floor to Adam Leonard, who is President Ashe and spokesperson at the US Embassy in Madrid, to say a few introductory words on behalf of um, the US uh, Embassy and also on behalf of the US Consulate. So Adam, the, for the floor is yours. I'm Adam Leonard, the spokesperson and press officer at the US Embassy in Madrid. And I just wanted to say that on behalf of the US Embassy, and our Consulate General in Barcelona, that we're very grateful to CIDOB for putting on today's program and to Professor Sam Woolley for his participation. From the Embassy, we think it's very important to uh, raise the profile um, and have conversations about the issue of disinformation and misinformation and to talk about tools that are available uh, to combat it. That's why we've worked with some journalists here in Spain to develop uh, a toolkit, an online digital toolkit called Learn to Check. You can find resources there at learntocheck.org um, that we hope will be useful to you with content in English, Spanish, and Catalan. Um, finally, just as a, a University of Texas alum, um, it's always great to have a fellow Longhorn uh, be participating in our programs, so I want to uh, throw a shout out there uh, to Sam Woolley and they say thank you so much for that, and we're just uh, really glad to be a part of today's program. Thank you. Let me give the floor immediately to Karma Kulomina, who will be chairing, introducing, and discussing the uh, the session. So, Karma. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. These are the challenges of this new digital reality we're dealing with. So, um, let's go to to the talk. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to Samuel Woolley, who is in Austin already with us, uh, because uh, I'm I'm really. Uh, curious and, and eager to have this conversation on this information and on his work on computational uh, propaganda. So the use of social networks to try to, um, to leverage people, to try to influence people. We will talk how technology has changed, how has made us more vulnerable, how is affecting, impacting on truth and on trust um, he has a, a very recent book, in fact, his latest book is called The Reality Game, How the Next Wave of Technology Will Break the Truth, and it was released in January 2020. So uh, th congratulations for the new book. And, and it's very interesting to, to see how you explore the ways of how these new technologies will be really affecting uh, public opinion. So uh, let's start there, um, Samuel. I, I would really like you to explain uh, the concept of manufacturing consensus. This is where we were inviting the people to join us to discuss today. How can consensus be manufactured? And what has really changed in this um, new digital reality? Because we, everyone knows that propaganda has existed for so long as we can talk and, and explain ourselves, but um, we are in a completely different situation now. So let, let's start there if, if you agree with that. Of course. Yeah, so um, this is a perfect place to start. Uh, manufacturing consensus is uh, something that a lot of you might recognize um, uh, because there was a term uh, in a book called Manufacturing Consent by Herman and Chomsky in the 1980s, and then it was updated in the early 2000s. And Herman and Chomsky really famously created this thing called the propaganda model. 
uh, in which they tried to discuss the ways in which big media, so uh, conglomerates in the United States like ABC and NBC and all of these other organizations were sort of uh, spreading the messages of the powerful. So they were manufacturing consent for people who were in power because they were owned by these very powerful individuals. Well, in the social media era, a lot has changed. We still have a few powerful companies that uh, monopolize a lot of the flows of information online, um, but we now use social media, right? We're not in the broadcast era anymore. We're now in the social media era. And so we've moved from a uh, one-to-many media system where you had uh, in the United States people like Barbara Walters and Walter Cronkite uh, speaking to many people over uh, TV um, and other mediums. And now we have an era where anyone can be a journalist. Um, and the basic argument in, in my book, The Reality Game, and in, in my next book, which is actually called Manufacturing Consensus that comes out next year, is that uh, social media has made it possible for also anyone to be a propagandist. And so um, anyone can use a variety of different tools on Facebook or Reddit or Twitter in attempts to create the illusion of popularity for an issue. <clears throat> we all know that there's there's uh, this sense um, many times in politics that the loudest groups, the people that speak the loudest get heard the most. This is especially true in the United States. Uh, I'm sure it's true in Spain as well. And so online, this is doubly true. You can use lots of different technology to give yourselves an outsized effect. And there's lots of different ways you can do that. And I, I'm sure we'll touch on them, but you know, disinfo, misinfo, all of these sorts of things. Uh, I think that uh, we need to go for a little bit of terminology yeah. probably to start our conversation because um, we get also so many um, explanations of what can we consider this information. Uh, for the European Union, this information is any manipulation of content with the aim to harm or to make profit with. But there is also a very interesting debate even among those in the institutions working with, with uh, disinformation lately who say that maybe when we talk about disinformation, we shouldn't uh, just limit ourselves to talk about content, but go beyond and talk about the uh, activities, the coordinated activities to manipulate people. So could we consider that this information is related only about falsehood or, or manipulative con content? Or can we also consider this information the tactics, the strategies to manipulate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the most basic definition of disinformation um, is, in my, in my opinion, is the, the purposeful spread of false or misleading or manipulative information. Uh, it's kind of a combination of these things. And so it has to do with intention usually. Um, and, and this is uh, in contrast to misinformation, which is accidentally spread. Uh, so, you know, the Russian government might spread disinformation uh, during an election in another country in an attempt to mislead voters. And that is disinformation because it's intentional versus misinformation. Maybe my grandmother reads a piece of news and she and she thinks it's real, but it turns out that it's from a fake publication and she spreads it. That's unintentional. It's misinformation. Your question's a really good one because uh, oftentimes there is so much of a focus on content. We focus so much on um, the types of messages, whether it's memes or videos, uh, the words that they contain, whether or not they're they're false. And we get into this big debate of what is true versus what is false. And we it's kind of this regressive thing where we eventually get back into really in-depth philosophical questions about epistemology and ontology, and it becomes very, uh, very difficult. Almost every time I give a talk, someone asks me in the audience, but how do we know something is true? How do we know, you know? And that's, a, I, I wish I could answer that, right? Like I think Plato and Socrates and all of these people have been arguing about this for a long time. When we consider disinformation, we can't just consider content. There's two other things we have to think about too. We have to think about production. So we have to think about who is doing the building of this content. Um, this has been the major focus of my research actually. Um, most of my research is qualitative. So I do interviews with the people who make and build these propaganda systems. So I spend time in places like Turkey or uh, India or the United States. And I talk to these political consultants or PR firms or other organizations that are doing this. So production is really important. 
we should look at the content and understand the content. But on the other side of the content is the reception, right? And what, we have to ask ourselves really important questions about why do people consume this kind of uh, false or misleading information? What is it about it that makes them want to actually share it and spread it? Um, and so why is disinformation a potent strategy that then turns into misinformation, you know? And, and because oftentimes um, the disinformation is just the starting point. The misinformation uh, and, and regular people like us spreading it is, is, the, uh, is how it ends. I mean, we will go to the why right away, but when you were talking about that people uh, complains about how to know what it's true and, and what's not, I was also thinking on, on this idea that um, there is a risk when we talk about this information on criminalizing social networks as a whole, because um, when we say that with this flood of content that we get, through uh, social networks that we lost truth. I think that we mainly lost is trust because truth is there, but it's it's just in the middle of so many different contents that what we lost is our capacity to really understand what to believe and what not, how to identify what, what's right and what, what's not. So it's not really a matter of, of truth only, but on, on reliability, on the sources, not only on the contents, but probably also on, on the sources. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely right. Um, we, we get caught up in these, these, these perceptions of truth and false, and oftentimes uh, we forget about things like trust. We forget about you know, uh, where the truth is grounded, and, and trust in our community is really important. We're talking about social networks, right? They're social. They're these spaces where we interact with people, uh, ideally people, we think they're people. But part of the problem is that that's the, key, that's the key idea, right? We think that we're interacting with people that we can trust. And for a long time, these social networks were kind of blindly built upon this, uh, you know, blindly or willfully ignorant, you might say, built upon this system in which they trust, they had this implicit system of trust, where there was an assumption that we would all sort of do the right thing. Um, I would also say, though, that like, you know, they left open a lot of gaps wherein things like bots, which many people have probably heard about automated profiles, people building fake profiles uh, could could infiltrate. And so these two issues um, really of anonymity and of automation have made it really difficult for people to trust these systems, but also uh, there's knowledge now that the, the, that the systems themselves, the trending algorithms, the recommendation algorithms, the things that tell us which news we should read, who we should be friends with, who, sh who what we should interact with, that they can be gamed, that consensus can be manufactured, right? Um, this illusion of popularity can be gamed through the usage of all of these tools. And so now people say, look at the internet and they say, they look at social media and they say, I, I don't know whether or not what I'm seeing is real or fake. I don't know if the people I'm interacting with on Facebook groups or on Twitter are like, you know, real or fake. But there's also something deeper there, too, which is which is just this idea that the institutions themselves, Facebook, Twitter, these companies, that they have been really slow to respond to these issues. And they have uh, constantly dragged their feet, as we say in the United States. Um, and said these things like, we're not the arbiters of truth. We don't, we don't have a job in, in making what, what is true and what is false. And, and what we've all realized is that that's frankly a lie. That's not the case because what the case is, is that they do curate our information. They do make decisions about how we see content and why. That doesn't mean, and this is the last thing I'll say on this point, that doesn't mean that these platforms are all bad. There's lots of good things that can happen there. Activists can use them to still coordinate and organize, but we have to rethink and reframe how these social media companies uh, are situated in society and how they're built. Maybe it's the last thing you say, but it's definitely the beginning of a, of a new discussion because for me, this is one of the key points of, of all this. Uh, this is why sometimes I'm so reluctant to talk only about content, because for me, content is very much related to, to the freedom of speech. And I'm much more on the line that you already mentioned on, um, on the processes, on the algorithms, on 
putting the pressure on all these social networks for how they work. Who is deciding what sort of content I'm going to see when I'm connecting Twitter or, or Facebook. So there is a responsibility that goes beyond the quality of content. And it's the ones who are organizing, the ones who are deciding and putting the content I will receive in a certain order that I didn't, I didn't uh, specifically decide. It was more that someone from my digital identity, from how I act probably in social media has decided that this is what I should read or, or see at the beginning. So that's for me one of the, the key points. And when you talk and you study, your research is a lot on technology, in fact. And that's one of the key of the technology. Uh, how is technology going to be more uh, fair, less biased? How can be more transparent? How can we decide or act on the quality of the content we get without just deciding that we are going to erase content, that we are going to use censorship. Do we have really uh, the tools necessary for that so far? Fantastic questions and points. Uh, you know, um, I think social media companies for a long time have, have attempted to make society think that these systems that they build are objective that because they uh, they use mathematical formulas, algorithms, which are basically just mathematical formulas that tell us if this happens, then that happens, um, that they are they are objective. But that's not the case, right? Like we've learned over the course of time that, that well, and we've known for a long time, science, science and technology studies has told us since, since it's been in existence, since the 60s, 70s, 80s, that technological systems are built in such a way that they contain the values of the people that build them. They prioritize specific things intentionally, right? And that's true of the algorithms as much as it's true of the social media systems on which the algorithms operate. And so Facebook uh, makes decisions about what kind of news you see. Uh, Twitter makes decisions about who they recommend to you as friends. Um, and they can't any longer hide behind these, uh, these systems and obscurity and most people's fear of math uh, to try to say that we don't make decisions. That for, for the longest time, you've seen people like Mark Zuckerberg uh, or Jack Dorsey say things like, um, you know, we are not a media company. We are, we're just a service. We're a technology company. But that's, that's bogus, right? Because what we know now from, the, from Pew and other organizations in the United States is that many people get their news from these platforms. And it's not about whether or not the platforms actually create the news. It's the fact that they curate the news and they make sure that we see specific things. And so, um, and so that is a big problem. And it's a big thing that I think we should all be thinking about. The question that you asked at the end is, what can we do? How can we recreate these platforms in such a way that they're not built with so much bias? Well, you have people like Safia Noble, who wrote the book Algorithms of Oppression, making these arguments that, in fact, like a lot of these, these systems are, are racist or, or they're, they're classist or they are doing things that are really problematic. And that's because they're built with an elite audience in mind. They're built with you know, the specific people in mind that built those platforms. And, and I would venture to guess that in the majority of cases in Facebook and Twitter, we're talking about white male engineers of a certain age that are building these kinds of platforms. And that, and that leads to a lot of the things that we see today because they have a very particular worldview. Um, the other thing is that these, these platforms are de designed with attention in mind, right? Everyone's heard this, this term, the attention economy. They've heard this, this new term from uh, Shoshana Zuboff, the, the surveillance, uh, the, uh, surveillance economy. Um, and so there's now this situation in which people's data is being bought and so sold. People are trying to stay on platform all the time. The argument I make in, in the reality game in my new book is that we have to rethink how to design these platforms with things like democracy and human rights in mind. And I don't mean democracy as in democratic governance. I mean like the core tenets of democracy, like you know, equality, yes, freedom of speech, but all of these other things as well. And human rights as in like, you know, uh, human rights from the U United Nations definition of human rights, rather than say building platforms that are, that are built upon this idea, they want you to get to stay on platforms so you see advertisements. Yeah, everyone is watching the social dilemma these days in in, uh, in Netflix, unfortunately. So we're we're talking about platforms. So that's that's the right. new reality. But it, it's true. I mean, what, what, 
if if social networks, if Twitter is is erasing a tweet and in if they are closing accounts, they can't say that they are not making decisions because this is an editorial decision to decide what to show and what not to show. I mean, they are deciding for me if I have the right to read something that can be inaccurate, but they are deciding on my free choice to read it. So they are already editorializing in, in a way. So they can't say that they are not curators. That's the first. The second thing, it's completely, I, I agree completely, this idea that we, or, or at least the technological companies rely a lot on, on artificial intelligence, but we are teaching artificial intelligence to think uh, from our bias, in fact. So they, they still are really having problems uh, to, to accept some transparency, some accountability on the programs they use to program the artificial intelligence. So that comes to my next question. Uh, what, it, what it's true is that uh, technology will go always one step ahead. So anything that we can try to do to, to solve it, it will go, always go or be a little bit too late. So the things that we are discussing now are still valid if we take into account all these new technologies that you are already working on your book and, and researching with deep fakes, for instance, when we are talking on, on manipulating audios and videos. So it's not that we don't know what we read if it's true, it's that we can't even believe what we see. So that's the next step again. So um, how can we really come up in time for what is needed? Uh, yeah. Um, when I wrote the reality game, the goal was to think five years ahead rather than thinking five years behind. Um, I was I was seeing all of these books come out, and indeed, a lot of my research, uh, because of the nature of academic publishing, you know, it was two years two years later that it would come out, and and so I'd be really frustrated. Um, and so now, you know, we're having these conversations about social media platforms, and yes, indeed, like uh, things are moving, moving and progressing and changing. Um, and so the reality game does take as its point of consideration artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning, and goes into those uh, in a simple way, but also talks about pragmatically how it would actually work to use these things to spread disinformation. There's this big perception in the United States that this is already happening, that there's all these smart AI bots that are already out there attempting to manipulate public opinion. But the, the truth is that's not the case. Um, and so my whole premise in the book is rather than uh, what, we, what we might say is like litigating the past, rather than trying to constantly focus on what's happened, we need to look forward and we need to do some forecasting. And so it's not, it's not as if, you know, it's not, this is not an argument to say that deep fakes will be the next big thing and that they will cause massive problems in people's trust. I think that we can see indications that that might be the case. What I'm arguing in the book and what I think is really important is that we should say, here's the things that we know are coming on the horizon. And here's what we can do to prepare ourselves for preventing those things from becoming uh, as big a problem as what we've seen happen with bots or with sock puppets or with algorithmic manipulation on Twitter and Facebook. And so the reality game is about the next wave of social media. Um, and that's why there's this ominous subtitle. It's because it's supposed to provoke people into being concerned, right? Like, you know, if uh, in England, it also had this, this other part of it, the subtitle, how the next wave of technology will break the truth and what we can do about it, which to me is really important um, because I'm not technologically deterministic. I don't believe that it's the technology itself that is the problem. In fact, more than anything, I believe that it's the social inputs that are the problem. And so the big questions in the book are, look, you have Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, these companies investing tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars into virtual reality right now. They, you've had the CEO of, of Apple say that in the next 10 years, they want to shift people away from their smartphones and towards virtual reality or augmented reality. What does that mean for the ways in which we experience truth or fault, true or false or trust or, or, or distrust? Um, and so this book is an exploration of like, here's the, here's the, here's the things on the horizon and here's what we can do to prevent these things from happening. And I think karma, like the really interesting thing is 
is they're really particular social choices we have to make. We have to educate ourselves, but there's also really particular design choices that have to be made at the site of the technology creation about like how we build these platforms and what we what we prioritize, right? Yeah, that's that will be um, to talk a little bit more uh, on on the digital order because we really are in the middle of a clashing of of models of technological models. If we think in the U.S. and and China, and this has been very much uh, discussed during the pandemics. Uh, for sure, but I, I would I, I would like to to talk a little bit longer on the effects on the impacts of this disinformation because we talk a little bit about citizens at the beginning. Now that you were also mentioning the individual choices, so uh, one of the things that you you explain in your research is that there there are people who just come across uh, disinformation. Um, by chance or without looking for it, and maybe they can retweet it. But um, there are people that they are really looking for this information, that they are really being part of the chain of that. So that will be my first question. The first is why people is looking for that? Why are they accepting to be part of it? And what are the effects, well, of this manufactured consensus? And let me... Uh, let me remind everyone who is following us uh, through YouTube that they can send their questions already and I will be happy to introduce them already to you during this conversation or when we have a, a quarter to a quarter to six for, for us in Europe, uh, then I, I will put all the questions together. But if they already want to, to join us, they are most than welcome. So let's talk a little bit on, on these individual issues and, and the effects of the disinformation. Yeah, and, and uh, I think this has been the million dollar question, right? You know, what are the effects of this stuff? And you have a lot of people like political scientists and psychologists who are, you might say uh, from an academic standpoint, more post-positive. They're kind of these people that are oriented towards like being able to measure very clear effects and experimental conditions. Jacques Ellul, who's a famous sociologist in France, made this argument that propaganda is a sociological phenomenon, right? It's all around us. You can't really put propaganda into a vacuum and try to measure the effect of propaganda because as soon as you take it out of the context, as soon as you take it off the platform in the cultural context of the United States or Spain or Russia versus the United States or what have you, it's out of context, right? You can't measure the effect anymore. It's not the same thing. And so um, I'm, I'm a big advocate for saying that you know, when we talk about effects of disinformation or of propaganda, we have to think about oftentimes second or third order effects. Like we're not saying, for instance, that a piece of disinformation spread and a thousand people saw it and a thousand people changed their vote for another candidate. That's much too easy, right? Like that's not the goal of this kind of stuff. The goal is to make people apathetic. It's to make people upset or disenchanted. It's to make people check out of the political process or it's to make them more polarized, right? We already have a massive problem across the United States and Western Europe with polarization. It's to make them distrust institutions. It's to make them distrust journalism. It's this slow degradation of democracy and of, of trust in democracy. Um, and you've seen this around COVID as well with massive distrust in masks or the vaccine. Um, and and that, that, is, that is really one of the big, you know, sort of like long-term overarching effects. Now, your sort of second part of the question is why do people buy into this? What is it about people like looking at disinformation that, that makes them want to spread it? Well, I wrote this paper with a colleague, Katie Joseph. She's a senior researcher in my, in my, on my research team at University of Texas called the demand for deceit, the demand for deceit. And it's all about the way, the reasons why people spread disinformation. We look at two case studies. We look at a case study in Macedonia and a case study in Mexico. And what we find is that there's all these passive and active drivers for why people spread disinformation and propaganda. Passive drivers, meaning you're doing things that you don't really think about doing, things that are implicit in you. One of them, for instance, is truth bias. So psycho the psychological literature shows us that truth, that people are more uh, likely to believe something is true than they are to believe something is false. You might think that this is the opposite of how you actually are, but all of us tend to be more trusting. We tend to think like, oh, I'll just share this because it seems like it's real. 
And that leads to us sharing a lot more disinformation online. The research shows that we share much more, disinformation spreads much quick, more quickly than true information. Bad news travels faster than good news on social media. Then there's all these active measures, right? Or active drivers, sorry, active drivers. And one of the biggest active drivers that I, I like to talk about is the bandwagon effect, right? We're talking about manufacturing consensus here. The bandwagon effect is this active uh, driver of why people spread disinformation. And it is this idea that we are, tend to share information based upon what we think other people will like, what we think other people are sharing. And so if this whole disinformation environment is built in such a way that it makes us feel like everyone around us is sharing this kind of content, we're much more likely to share the content too. And that is exactly how Manu consensus gets manufactured. We get this illusion of something being real or something being popular because we just want to fit in. And so the psychology of it's really, really interesting, but uh, there hasn't in fact been a lot of research done on it. And I think it's because it's very hard to isolate these things as variables in a lab and do experiments on them. Yeah, there are very interesting research on that saying that at the end we believe that it's something it's true if it's shared by many people. So at the end, it's this, the, the group confirmation, in fact, that it's already working. And we tend to, to believe what it's really fitting with our values or our views much more than if it's true or not. So th this is, at the end, deciding for us. Probably it has, it has always been like this. It's just that now it has a completely different reach, probably, that, that it used to have. And, and that's one of the problems. Um, let me ask you, because I, I can't help not to ask you, uh, for for what does it mean in for the U.S. politics? In fact, you come from a, uh, a very tight political <laughs> elections uh, at the White House. They they are still there in in the confrontation with the results. So what happened with this information and certainly with com conspiracy theories that we could also read in in this campaign uh, this time in the U.S. and can we compare it with what happened in 2016? Yeah, um, we've had four years uh, in the United States where disinformation has been a mode of acting, where uh, you know you have people fact-checking um, people at the highest levels of office in the United States and finding that the, that there's more lies being spread than ever before, you know, relatively speaking, um, and that social media plays a bigger role in politics than ever before. Um, it's no stretch to say at all that that Donald President Donald Trump uses Twitter as his preferred uh, mode of communication. Um, and this has particular implications, right? Because we know that these systems can be manipulated. We know that there's a lot of ways in which social media is in, is unsecure. Uh, in fact, you have people like the groups like the FBI and other intelligence agencies in the United States uh, making arguments that, you know, this is a really serious concern for national security. Um, but then you also simultaneously have politicians engaging in very salacious kind of uh, misleading uh, discussions on social media. Um, is it similar to 2016? Oh, it's a completely different ball game than 2016. You know, like uh, in 2016, um, most people before the election, the US election, um, to most extent, were not very much focused on the problem of what was called fake news back then, like these all these false websites and things like that. It wasn't until the Brexit referendum in the UK and in, really until the 2016 election with the Russian interference in the election and Cambridge Analytica and all of these things that more people began to focus on this problem. And that's because it was happening in the United States, which is where most of these social media companies call home, right? But that doesn't mean that it wasn't happening before. You know, if you look at countries like Mexico, if you look at places like Ukraine, or uh, now Brazil, um, Ecuador, uh, Turkey, um, Philippines, like all of these places have been experiencing dis and misinformation from people in very high levels of political office for years. Uh, and this has been willfully ignored. Um, the social media companies absolutely have played a role in all of this. They've, they've facilitated the ability of these politicians to lie to the people. They've facilitated the ability also, though, of other organizations and individuals. Remember, one of the key ideas, or maybe not remember, but one of the key ideas in my next book is that propaganda has been democratized. And people kind of hate this idea because it's kind of a contradiction in some ways. But the basic idea is anyone can spread propaganda now.
And because the social media uh, platforms are built in the way that they are, um, politicians and people in powerful uh, positions can really make the most of the fact that everyone can lie online and they can uh, choose what they think is true and what they think is false. And we see this happening in the United States where politicians will basically retweet people saying, look, here's a popular citizen who's like repeating something that, that is completely false, but that, that the politician is using as kind of like what we would call in the United States a softball uh, pitch to them so that they can, you know, spread a dialogue or a, a message that benefits them, but that does not really benefit society or democracy. And then we have the the president believing <clears throat> believing in the power of capital letters. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing. Oh, and, and you know, like one, one thing I would say, yeah, the, the power of capital letters is huge. The other thing I would say is yeah. that there's this perception, and, and my friend Tim Huang, uh, who's a frequent collaborator of mine, says this, um, and so I'm borrowing it from him, and so I should cite him. Um, but he says, there's this perception in modern society of the marketplace of ideas. And there's this perception that the best ideas will rise to the top no matter what. That it's okay, we don't need to regulate this space because the true ideas, the really good, the really smart ideas will rise to the top. Social media has proven this to be completely false. Yeah. The marketplace of ideas does not work uh, with social media because in fact, the worst ideas spread to the top. The most, uh, the most bogus, false, bad ideas spread to the top a lot of the time. Yeah, the ones that are quicker to, to <laughs> buy. We have a question from Andrea Garcia who says, um, despite the efforts of governments and institutions to raise awareness about this information, why do you think it remains a sexy tool for propaganda and disruption? I think, uh, you know, um, governments have tried to educate people, civil society has tried to educate people, so have academics, but we're still very early in this fight um, because for we had a love affair with, with social media for, for the first 12 to 15 years that Web 2.0 came about. Everyone was trying to tell each other that social media was going to be the savior of democracy and that it was going to be a place where anyone could get at, you know, access to information and talk to people and organize their political uh, civil disobedience or whatever have you. Um, and so we're still early on in the fight. That's one thing that's really important to know. I'm positive because uh, in 2016, well, when I started doing this work in you know, 20, 2013, 2012, no one was having these kinds of conversations. No one wanted to have this, these discussions and that was very tricky. Um, and so I'm glad that more people are talking about this now. The fact that we're here together talking about this is, is a silver lining. The reason why disinformation remains a popular tactic is because it destabilizes people. It's, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool to create a vacuum of power. Um, and people like Vladimir Putin uh, or Erdogan in Turkey or Duterte in the Philippines, they understand this. That if you can create a lot of distrust and a lot of polarization, that if you have this strong political presence, i.e. like Putin or Duterte, step in and say, everything's really confusing. There's all this bad stuff online, but I'm here to tell you what is true. I'm here to tell you what you should do, that they can fulfill that, that vacuum of power and they can, they can start to act and do the things that they want to do. And so disinformation will always be a powerful tool for politics and it always really has been. Uh, yeah, and, and not only in these regimes, I'm afraid, because I think that one of the worrying things that, that we really witnessed during the pandemics is that uh, many of the laws approved to fight or to tackle this information during the pandemic, uh, they turn to be laws restraining the freedom of speech or of political opposition. Also inside the European Union, there were laws like these in, in Hungary or in Romania. So that, that's the other tricky thing when we talk about regulation. What do we mean when we talk about regulation? Because so far, uh, first of all, it's very difficult to regulate without interfering with certain rights. And second, when we talk about uh, regulation, we are talking about uh, from many different perspectives. And, and I will explain myself a little bit. There was this um, debate at the UN in December on, on cyber crime. What do we consider cyber security in, for, for United Nations? 
And of course, there were two completely opposite visions of what can we consider a cyber threat because for the US, Canada, the EU cyber threat was hacking. So it was more attempting to your security. But then for China, Russia, Turkey, a, a cyber threat was using social media to confront power. So we started talking about terminology and we are there again. So how can we regulate or at least to try to have um, multilateral perspective on an issue, a global phenomenon that it's viewed in a very different ways depending on, on the regimes or, or the governments? Yeah, I mean, you've put your finger on it here. Uh, there's this fantastic paper that I remember reading when I was doing my dissertation um, called Open Networks, Close Regimes by Shanti Kalathil and, and Boaz. Uh, and Shanti is now at National Endowment for Democracy and does work on these questions. And that paper makes these arguments um, that, you know, in many countries around the world, the internet has never been this open, free space where we were allowed to spread democracy and, and all these sorts of things. And so I, the reason I make this point is that the internet looks different around the world in different places. Um, and so this perception that, you know, uh, it's always the same as, as what it is in Spain or in the United States is, is not the case. And so I guess maybe one of the points is that there's, there might not be a one size fits all solution to this problem. That, 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 that not only technologically is that not possible, but also socially that's not really possible because we're talking about, you know, if we, we, if we look at a country like, uh, if we look at a country like Qatar, and then we compare it to a country like Spain, you know, we're talking about two very, very cultural circumstance, different cultural circumstances. When it comes to regulating the internet sphere, I think we have to be very careful because um, uh, we're, we're, we have two things kind of on either, on that are being balanced. On the one hand, you have, you have privacy and you have safety and we wanna preserve people's privacy and we wanna preserve people's safety. But on the other hand, you have free speech and you want to be able to preserve free speech because the idea here is like if you start to regulate speech and tell people what they can and can't say, then eventually when a despot comes into power, they will use those free speech laws to benefit themselves. They'll throw everyone in jail for saying bad things about them. And, and, and also what's done in Spain or what's done in the United States, if we make decisions to limit free speech in our countries, that places like Saudi Arabia will look to what we're doing and say, oh, the United States did this, so we're going to limit free speech, but they're going to use it for their own means and ends to throw their opposition in jail. Or, and so, so we have to be very careful, but that's not to say that there's not things we can do. There are things we can do. And the, the, the few things that, I, that come to the top of my mind when we talk about this are, number one, we have to hold people liable for spreading dis and misinformation, purpose, actually for spreading disinformation and propaganda that falsely uh, tries, to, tries, to, tries to push people in false directions about how to vote, where to vote, when to vote, anything to do with the voting process, that, that's already illegal, but like we're not really holding people criminally liable for spreading that kind of content, and that has to be held criminally uh, you know, liable. Um, the other thing is that we need to protect uh, marginalized communities. And a lot of the disinformation and misinformation that flows tends to target these or these these uh, these people. So the Muslim community, the Jewish community, uh, in the United States, um, black people, Mexican people, uh, Latinos, um, and that's a really big problem. And right now, they're not being really protected from a lot of this content. Uh, and so we have to figure out ways to protect them from some of the most vile and vicious stuff. Also, we have to figure out ways to protect journalists because journalists oftentimes are on the major receiving end of this. Also, women. Um, and so, like, you know, there's, there's particular ways we can focus on groups and protecting those particular groups. Um, that gets us into the direction of having this discussion about things like hate speech uh, and hate speech laws, which I know in Europe there are hate speech laws. In the United States, there are not hate speech laws. That being said, if you are threatening someone with violence or if you are uh, continuously harassing someone, that is illegal. And that has to be uh, held as illegal. And right now, at least in the United States, we're not doing anything about it. We're saying that because we, because we hold free speech as this really important thing, we think that we can't do anything else. And I'm here to tell you, and I make this argument in the book, that 
it's it's not as if we can either have free speech or we can have safety and privacy. We can have both things, but we have to be very particular about focusing in on the places where particular harms are caused and and try to create legislation and regulation around that. And the last thing I'll say on this is that we can't leave that up to social media companies. It can't just be social media companies that do this work. Um, I know that Spain has its own, uh, you know, let's just say problems or issues going on with the regulation of speech surrounding disinformation. Um, so we don't want to leave it just to technology companies, but we also don't just want to leave it to the government. We can't just allow the government to make these decisions with impunity. We also need to bring in civil society people. We need to bring in experts, what I call public interest technologists, journalists, academics, these other people to help to make these regulations because we don't want to give anyone all the power in this situation. No, and, and because um, the lines are so blur that it's very difficult to decide anything if you don't really have a very strong consensus because this information, it, it's not illegal per se. Lying, it's not illegal. So you do have to concentrate on what is really a crime. So hate speech would be a crime and making money affecting people's health, for instance, with this information could be considered also uh, something uh, to be punished. But, but of course, lying is not. So that's, that's how you need to really, you really have to build a consensus yeah. here too. That's, but we have uh, two questions, in fact. Um, we have a question from Pera Villanova. What is the red thin line separating opinion from propaganda? So he says, freedom of speech is a basic civil right, but not a illimited one. So is there a frontier? Yeah, so um, I teach media law here at University of Texas. It's one of the classes I teach. And so I, I love this question. It's a really good one. Is there a limit to free speech? Yes, there's a limit to free speech. And what is the limit? Well, I think that the limit is when you can start to measure very particular harms and, uh, with people. I think that, uh, you know, we're not talking about someone being offended because of, of being offended is not is not a, a harm, at least in the United States, per perception of, of, of the law. Um, However, when it is leading to something like harassment, uh, when it leads to measurable psychological harm, when it leads to when it when it when the th when it contains actual threats, so death threats uh, in, or incitements to violence, those are lines that we have to we have to hold, and um, and so there are clear places where we can say, look, <laughs> there's always been this idea in the United States. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater, right? Um, because <laughs> this is this is this will cause like death and destruction. And the same should be true online. You shouldn't be able to incite these kinds of things online. And um, sometimes people make mistakes. Uh, of course, like you know, you have teenagers online, and you also, but then you also have a whole infrastructure of companies and other individuals who are making a lot of money off of selling these kinds of products that lead to a lot of these problems. And so uh, one of the things that I haven't mentioned yet, which I should mention, is that we have to hold these companies liable. We have to stop this whole shadow market of like organizations, what people call dark PR firms and other organizations, from making millions of dollars off of selling disinformation and falsehood. I really appreciate that we have so many people joining the conversation that that's great. And I really thank you for the question. So Raquel Jorge says, do you think that freely readable terms and conditions when accessing a new app or social media is an effective solution to raise people's awareness or is it just a secondary tool? I think that terms of condition, term, uh, <laughs> terms and conditions on these social media applications and on third party applications tend to be very predatory. They rely upon the idea that you don't read them. Um, and so making them more freely readable is a step in the right direction. Making it possible for people to really understand what they're getting themselves into is a step in the right direction. But we can't just have, um, you know, terms of service or what have you in the absence of regulation. We can't allow the social media companies to say, well, I set it up front and therefore, uh, you know, I'm still, I'm therefore allowed to, you know, sell someone's data to a predatory organization or something like that. Because right now that's the way that things are, right? You have GDPR in Europe and you have more protections for people's data in Europe. In the United States, no one has, we don't have this protection. And so I don't think that terms of service um, will be a solution. Uh, I think that, Yes, I would like to see 
<laughs> uh, more clarity in like what these apps are allowed to do and what these companies are allowed to do and them being more upfront. Uh, but I think that there's always ways to get around what people pay attention to and what they don't. In fact, GDPR is always a very tricky yeah. part of the transatlantic relations between the EU and, and the US. We have also a question from Marta Buces. Um, I don't know if I get everything. So isn't to think about that people tend to believe in conspiracy theories um, and misinformation because one, they are masquerade as posts from individuals and two, we're losing trust in public institutions? So um, I think I understand what's going on here. So um, in my book, The Reality Game, what I say is that conspiracy theory, uh, you know, the reason people believe in conspiracy theories is it feels a lot like critical thinking. Conspiracy theory is like, you know, you're getting off an exit too soon on the road to critical thinking. You, there's, all, there's usually these fragments of truth in conspiracy theory, and then it spins out from there. Uh, and what we know based upon the psychological literature, remember I talked about the demand for deceit, we know that people are more likely to buy into this stuff. Um, and, and so conspiracy theories can be very uh, compelling. There's a reason why in the United States we've had these tabloids like the National Enquirer that sell stories like Bat Boy and like, you know, these crazy like things that we know are completely fake, but people buy them and they love them. Um, and those have been around for a really long time. People love stories. We can't stop people from spreading conspiracy theories. But what we can do is create a new system and a new infrastructure for media literacy, for learning. Um, you have people like Dana Boyd, who runs uh, Data and Society in New York, a think tank here, having come up a couple of years ago with some very pointed feedback and critique about how we do media literacy now and how we do informational literacy and how we can actually move the dial a little bit forward so that conspiracy theories aren't so popular and so that we can begin to rebuild trust in institutions. Um, right now, we have this situation with QAnon in the United States, and it's spreading abroad as well. But uh, it's really scary because a lot of my friends and family, people that I care about and love, I was talking to my wife about this yesterday, are beginning to spread these kinds of conspiracies uh, in a way that they never were two years ago. And so the question is, like, where's the intervention point and what can we do? And, and I'm afraid that I don't really have the answer to that. Yeah, and you were mentioning the, the media system, and that's really important. I mean, we've seen it at, at the EU level also that there is a big difference among member states between those who have a very uh, reputational or strong media system and those who really don't have a strong media system. And they people tend to rely more on what they see on the internet because they they consider that traditional newspapers, they all belong to political parties and they are not truthful oh, yeah. at all. And with that, you just have to see the figures for Sweden and compare them to Greece. And you will see that we are talking about completely opposite media systems. So that's also very difficult then from EU side to try to regulate because realities are different even inside the European Union. So yeah, sure. we have many dif different questions. So I will shorter myself and I will give the floor to Adria Rodriguez now. He says, do you think that social media companies are the better positions to balance these damages against freedom of speech and moderate their users' contents or only the judiciary should decide? I think it has to be a combination of both. So we've, we've relied upon self-regulation, at least in the United States, uh, and to most degrees in Europe as well for a long time. And we've seen what self-regulation gets us. Self-regulation gets us what we have now. Um, the social media companies benefit from uh, the infrastructure like bots and all of these things that that allow for the perception of more users, more people clicking on ads. And so they actually make money from this, this infrastructure. And so we can't rely upon them to, to only uh, regulate. We have to have the government regulating as well, but we also need to bring in civil society. We need to bring in other groups. Um, in, the, in the reality game, the big thing I argue for is this idea of the public interest technologists. Right now, all the best and brightest computer scientists are going to work for Google and they're going to work for Facebook. We need more people going to work with uh, the EU parliament and with the United States government that understand how these systems work in order to create more sensible regulations because up to date, the laws that have been created have been very heavy handed and almost like without an understanding of how the technology works. There are lots of reports at the European Parliament on ethics for technology, but we should see what they will come from from that. 
There is a question from Finlay Jones. Uh, the speed and fluidity of social media evolution routinely undermines outdated laws. What is the solution so-called social media councils or SM platforms paying for the news they curate? So, um, so yeah, so things are always progressing and evolving on social media and it's really difficult for the laws to keep abreast of this. Um, I still don't think that that's really a, uh, an excuse. I think that it's time for government and the law to like get onto the level of technology because the technology is here and it's here to stay. You can't put it back in the box now that it's out. And so you, in the United States, for instance, you have the Federal Elections Commission and FCC kind of like making decisions to kind of like ignore a lot of this stuff. And that, that we can't accept that anymore. That, that's unacceptable. Um, social media councils. Well, I mean, if the councils are created, you know, like the Facebook Oversight Board, they have to include civil society members. They have to include journalists. They have to include regulators. These councils need to be made up of people from across multiple social media platforms, not just one. We can't pretend like that we can balkanize and like separate Facebook and let Facebook create their own council and Google create their own council. Mm -hmm. Propaganda is a, a trans-platform international problem and it, it is not something that they can manage on their own. Yeah. Adria Tardi, uh, what do you think about Twitter alerting on Trump's fell false messages or journalists interrupting him to say he's lying? Is that effective among his followers or just among those who already oppose him? It's not really very effective. Um, the research shows that fact-checking in that way uh, actually makes people cement their views, double down, believe more in, in the fake things than, than think that they're correct. Because like, you know, put yourself in their position. You have someone from on high Twitter or a journalist correcting the pe person you believe in and you're saying, oh, well, it's, you know, it's the media. Um, that's not to say that we shouldn't do it. I think it is an important practice because, you know, interrupting them and not allowing them just to continue does stop the person that's trying to spread the lies. But we have to come up with new and more unique and more, more eff efficacious ways of fact-checking. And fact-checking has to be revolutionized. And so organizations like First Draft um, or uh, the Pointer Institute in the United States are doing a lot of work to think, rethink how we do fact-checking. And in fact, they work a lot in networking also. So that, that's a good thing. That's a transatlantic thing also for, yeah. for fact-checkers platforms. Um, Jaime Cabrera asks, how can we make users accountable from purposefully disseminating this information globally while respecting the sovereignty of states and the agency of their people? So if people are, if they're, dis, if they're disseminating disinformation, so if they're purposefully spreading false content across international borders, particularly during elections, they should be held accountable because in, in the, for the most part, those, those things are illegal. So it's illegal for a foreign entity, say for instance, to interfere in the United States election. Um, and those things should be deleted, caught and deleted. Right now we're in a position where the social media platforms are so massive and they've scaled to such extents that they can't use, that they're really far behind in being able to, to get rid of this content, even with this magical AI that, that Mark Zuckerberg keeps proposing will be the solution to this. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, the internet challenges these questions of sovereignty and states and, and the ways in which, you know, borders exist. And so I think in a way we have to rethink the ways in which informational borders exist or do not exist. And we have to actually come up with a more, a better universal approach to this. And that's why you have groups like the UN and UNESCO actually doing work to, to actually think through these problems. And, and that would be probably, again, another terminologic discussion because um, when I use the term sovereignty, I, I like to think on individual sovereignty, to be sovereign on my own data in fact, and, and my privacy more than states or, or borders. So there are also different uses for, for the word. So, and finally, one question from Carlos, um, regarding conspiracy theories, QAnon, is it a, is a great example on how online radicalization can jump onto the offline wall? What are your opinions about the evolution of the movement in, in the US? QAnon has, has progressed from being a very uh, fringe conspiracy theory that not many people believed to being a much more popular conspiracy theory. And it's because of the affordances of these online spheres in, in, in many ways. 
So yes, polarization is a big problem. We have lots of social issues going on in the United States. So people are buying more into this stuff. But the people who make and spread disinformation surrounding QAnon, who purposefully spread this content, understand that they can popularize the content by making it more appealable or more palatable to a general audience. And so they've really built upon this idea of save the children and of child sex trafficking and all of this stuff, which is an idea that like most people can buy into and say, yes, no one believes that children should be uh, bought and sold. Um, but it's all based upon this false premise um, QAnon, the brilliance of QAnon, if you like, has been to, has been to co-opt lots of other concerns. So it's, it's entered into the, uh, anti-vaccine community by co-opting their concerns about like children getting sick from vaccines. It's, it's co-opted like healthy living communities that say that they don't want chemicals in their food and moved into all of these sorts of things by hedging it in the conversation of children and talking about children. And so like, you know, what you need to think about in these conspiracy theories is how they are using particular ideas, tropes, uh, themes to popularize themselves and work to, to cut back on them in, in, by fighting back against those themes and saying this is just basically completely fake. Um, and QAnon is, QAnon is a really dangerous one because, like, you have people in the United States government. We have a congressperson that's just been elected that believes in QAnon and that says QAnon is real. And QAnon has some very far out beliefs. Like we're talking about some of the more, the more usual, normal ones. Some of the QAnon beliefs are very, very far out there. And it's amazing that they have gone so far from our point of view, oh, from mine my too. point of yeah. view. Well, we said that we would end at six, but we had so many questions that it was it was difficult to end. And I really appreciate that. I mean, it was a real pleasure to, to have this talk so difficult to summarize Same. everything we said and everything that we should still say, because it's such a multifaceted uh, challenge. In fact, that we just probably just put some key ideas and, and yeah. there would be time for much more. But... Uh, I think we can stay with the idea that the need for accountability, the need to find a solution with, with social media, but mostly a consensual solution in, in having the, the, the civil society researchers, fact checkers, journalists on board, because at the end, this is a societal challenge, not only political, it's the society that is changing. So let me thank you on behalf of everyone who was here, who is joining us today and joining the conversation, Samuel Wally, for, for being here. Also thanking the US Embassy and the Consulate in Barcelona for facilitating us this opportunity. And well, uh, we will look forward reading your next book very yeah. soon. Good luck with your research. and. Thank you very much for, for your thoughts and for sharing them with us. Thank you all for having me. And, and I think the big thing to remember is, you know, what's the next wave of social media? How can we design with human rights in mind? So that's the challenge for everyone. Go out there and build the next thing. Okay, we will end here <laughs> then. Thank you very much okay. and good Bye. luck. See you Bye. soon. Bye. Bye-bye everyone. <laughs>